stuff. Um, so, so, and um, so sometimes, so let's see where. <laughs> very hard for me to see the green markers from back, so I'll try not to use them unless I need that fourth color. Okay, so, um, um, thresholds, okay, so, um, so sometimes you, you can know something about that data, and you know something about the size you want your clusters. Um, it, you could say, so there are problems where you're trying to cluster kind of populations on a, on a map, and you're saying that if you're, if, you're, if you're the post office, right, you're trying to put post offices in different locations, and you don't want your drivers to ever have to drive more than such a distance in one day, right? You have a natural, Upper bound on the size of a, of a, of a um, on, on, on the size of a cluster based on the distance from the centroid, which is where you put the post office. Um, you may also see other parameters like if it's if the size gets too big, there are too many people. You want to stop too because one driver can't go so far. But um, um, sometimes you have um, 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 physical. Known constraints, um, and you can just input some threshold based on these properties, and you can you can use your knowledge of the problem to do this, right? So this is in some cases that you don't need to use this kind of some sort of magical technique to do this. Um, so um, so this could be something like um, fixing a a spatial um, scale, or um, a um, or or some sort of size, some sort of capacity, right? Only so much mail can fit in a mail truck, right? Um, uh, so, as I mentioned, um, there are ways of looking at the density. Um, so the and the and the density can be defined in different ways. You can you can associate um, um, this is something like the number of points, you know, in in a cluster CI over um, the volume of CI, and so the number of points is clear how you define the volume could be defined in different ways. This could be the minimum enclosing ball that contains all these points. It could be um, it could be the, uh, the the convex hull of the points. You, you can define this in you know some variety of way, and it typically don't matter too much. So you want to do something that's easy. Um, if you're going to do something like the like the single link clustering, um, you may want to find this density in some um, local region. So every point does not have too much has at least so much mass around it for it to be considered. Um, and so if, if you do this, you want to say that higher density clusters are good. That means that the width of the clusters is going to be small if the density is high. So then if it goes over a density, um, then you'd stop. Um, so, let's see. Um, oh yeah, there's a, um, the other thing, just K. Sometimes you're, you're just given a parameter K. You say, I want K clusters. And this can, of course, run into those problems like I mentioned over there, but um, this is the most common type of parameter people use. They set some number k, I want 10 clusters, and that's it. Um, so a, sometimes there are reasons you're, you're saying, you know, I have the, if you're, if you're the postal service and you're trying to downsize your post offices, as is, seems to be the case, 
you can say, I only have a budget to be able to keep open 10 post offices in Salt Lake. Um, where should I put these post offices? And so then you have a budget specified how many you're allowed to have, and so that's, you know, what it is. Um, I may have heard that. It's okay. <laughs> I've, I've heard of that problem too. Um, so, and then um, there's this other technique called the elbow. Um, <coughs> Um, technique, spell that wrong, okay. Um, um, technique, and this is where you're tracking some parameter and you're not setting an absolute threshold, but you're looking at the, at, at, at the, at the difference between two values, right? So this is saying if the, um, if the, Um, if the density or it could be some other parameter, you know, it could be uh, the uh, size, could be something um, changes more than tau uh, from k to k plus one um, clusters. And so, so what you would do is you would you would make some plot, and you'd have something like um, you you some parameter, um, um, which is like the density that you're measuring of how good the cluster is, right? So it doesn't matter what this is, and then you have the number of clusters k, and as you you know as you start the density is zero, each point is a single cluster, and this is going to increase. And what happens is that it's going to increase slowly, meaning your clustering is working, and then at some point, it's going to kind of start increasing quickly um, as you get past more clusters. You're going to, so if you went back to this example here, right, as I, when k was, was equal to, um, so if I started here, maybe I had k equals to, to four like this, I went to k equals to three, and, and the density didn't change very much. I went to k equals two, um, I guess that k going the other way. So from n to, to one, right? So as k is decreasing. Um, so as k goes to two, all of a sudden the density of this cluster is, is, is really going to drop. Right, so, so the density, got this chart completely backwards, all right. Um, just do this over again. Uh, the, so the, the density, um, so this is, this is good, this is bad, this is K going from, going from one to N, and you start from N, and you start with a good density, and you, um, you start with a good density, which is high, and then at some point you drop. And it's, at some point, it's going to go from a very good density to something to start dropping to something that's lower density. As, as the density gets lower, it means that your clusters are no longer as good. And so it's not clear what the absolute value of density should be when you drop, but you want to look at the difference in these values. This is actually a discrete thing. Um, so maybe this point was good, and then the next point dropped down here, and then it just got worse. So this was the last good point. So this, the difference between these values was small, and now the difference between the values is large. So I didn't want an absolute, these other techniques where there's some absolute mark that you know, that I said maybe this was the mark that was that was good, and everything was below this, I didn't really know. Whereas if I changed it a little bit, it's I, I get a, a very different cluster. But if I look at the difference between two data points, then this really tells me where it starts to break down. <coughs> I'm not really gathering like points together anymore. Right, so, um, so, so this, this elbow technique where you're tracking these and then kind of finding the spot where it starts changing rapidly. 
And so if you're if you're doing this from some sort of like um, data analyst point of view, where you know you're working at a company and your boss gives you data and you say cluster this data, right? You have one data set. You want to come up with a really good cluster. Probably what you would do is you would do this and you would plot it and you would look at the plot. And there's some obvious spot where it's where it's a good cluster. And that's probably what you should do. If you're trying to automate this, it's a little bit trickier how to do that. But you want to look at these differences and look for jumps in these differences. And depending on whatever you know distance you're using, or um, you're going to get you're going to have to measure this different ways. Um, but this is one way of doing it. Um, okay, so um, so there's there's one more way of thinking about this threshold, and that has to do with the with the hierarchy in the cluster. Right, so let me write up another another example here. Um, So you can think of, so I'm going to think of points as having these labels on them. Uh, okay, and then I'm going to write down these numbers at the bottom. And normally the ordering is not going to work out as nice as this, but I. I know how it's going to work ahead of time, so I can do this. So, and then what's going to happen is you're going to run this algorithm, and you, the first step is you're going to join together <coughs> these two in a, in a clustering, and you're going to build kind of a cluster between these two elements at the same time. And then you join together these guys, and then the next step is join these, and then um, as you do this, you're building some new clustering up here. And then uh, if you join together these guys, you join them here, then maybe the, and you can keep running this until you only have one cluster left. And so you build this cluster here, and finally you build everything in one big cluster, and, and you complete this hierarchy. So you, you build this hierarchical tree. And so this is very common in um, like clustering species, like. Um, um, like phylogenetic trees, right? You're, you're doing this with species of animals. You're saying, you know, um, uh, you know, two types of birds are very similar, and then these are these are rectangles, and then these are mammals over here. So maybe, you know, dinosaurs and birds are more similar than humans, or something like that, right? So, so you you build these with species, and this is very common. Um, and so then you have this extra structure of these hierarchies, which means that um, you can build this all the way to completion. And then afterwards, to pick the threshold, you can kind of chop off the top of this tree at, at some point. So I'm only going to re retain these three clusters afterwards. So I can go back and post hoc, I can go and analyze this hierarchy and, and build my, figure out where my clusters are this way. And this may end up, have actually not been the same order I added them in. But I can go back afterwards and look at properties of this and find where's a good spot to kind of chop this off. Um, so and, and, and maybe, but there's more structure encoding here as well, right? If you notice, there's a cluster here inside of another cluster, right? So three and four are closer are closer together than the whole group three, four, five, right? So this may be the family of reptiles, and this may be a dinosaur, and this is an alligator, and this is a crocodile or something. I don't know, right? So, but there, there are sub subclusters inside of here, and so this hierarchical process is, you know, it's it's a little bit rigid how you do this algorithm, as we'll see, you know, in the next few lectures. Um, but but it gives you this extra structure that is not going to be necessarily available inside of the other. Things. You can get this out of the spectral clustering as well, um, but the spectral clustering is not. It turns out not to be very good at the lower end, it's better at the top end. And this is better at the lower end and maybe not as good as the top end. Um, 
So, so this is an extra structure you can think of having. And anytime you do a clustering, you could think of, you know, uh, don't just think of it as this partition which I uh, destroyed before, but think of it as you can think of it as a whole hierarchy of these partitions. And this is a way of kind of breaking down your data. Um, okay, and if, and if, if you look in the notes, I'm kind of proud of myself. I drew a really cool picture of that. So, so if this wasn't clear enough, you, can, you should go look at the picture. Um, okay, um, so before we move on with, uh, with the hierarchical, uh, past the hierarchical clustering, one last thing to look at is, is how long does it take to run this algorithm as stated here? Right, so like how, how long do each of these steps take, or does this whole process run? Um, let's look at this. So, so, um, so th this process doesn't, this takes, you need to scan over the data, it's linear time, right. so this isn't really a, a, a big cost. But now you're going through this while loop, and each step you're only merging together two clusters. So how many merges in total do you have if you have n data points? I, I heard lots of answers. I'm not sure I heard the right one. I, I'm sure someone knows it though. So, uh, it's, so okay. So I'll take a stab. I think it's it's a, it's a log of something. No, it's be larger than that. N choose two. No, it's less than N choose two. It's linear. It's you have n minus one merges, right? So, um, so it. If you think of playing a single elimination um, tournament, every time you join a cluster, one of the other clusters is losing, right? So, and each team loses at most once. So there, are, and one person never loses. So there are n minus one times you merge a cluster. So, the number of times you go through this while loop is n, right? So, n times So each time through this loop, now you need to find the closest two clusters. Okay, so, so now how long is it going to take to find the closest two clusters? Yes. So you want to check all closest distances, right? Um, so this can be about n squared. And this you can do, let's say, in constant time. So don't worry about this. So you have n times n squared. This is n cubed time. Um, and so this is this is pretty slow. Um, for large data sets, this typically is not going to be feasible to run it like this. So now we spent the whole last couple of weeks talking about finding the closest something or other, right? So um, find the closest distance, finding the approximate nearest neighbor and the nearest neighbor, right? Um, so what we, it seems we should be able to speed this up using some data structure, right? Um, the problem is that every time you merge together two, two clusters, one of your objects is changing. So you can keep, you can think of keeping like this, uh, like one of these, um, uh, this uh, uh, one of these KD trees to speed this up and do the nearest neighbor or the approximate nearest neighbor and faster than than n squared time. We're doing the Pauli sense of hashing, right? But you, you need to kind of update these things, and this can sometimes be tricky um, in order to do this. And you need the distance between the clusters to be something you can do the Pauli sense of hashing. On. And a lot of these distance, like the minimum length or the maximum distance. Is not something that's suitable well for locality sense of passion. Um, uh, but there are still ways you can you can speed this up a little bit. Um, you can think of there's there's a data structure called a um, priority um, Q. And so what this does is it maintains a, a set of objects and ob like, let's call it M objects. And it returns the smallest one in log m time. And it can handle insertions and deletions and also log m time. 
So can you get this down, if you put all distances in here, can you get this down to just log in in this step here? Well, you, you can't even do that. Um, you can't do log in because every time you change one of these points, you're changing about n distances. So think of the first n over 2 steps through here, they're n over 2 clusters. So they're, they're n, over, n over 2 choose 2 distances, which is about n squared. Right? So you're going to have, for half the time through the loop, you're going to have about, about a linear number of objects and about n squared distances you have to deal with. But on an update, you only need to update n of these distances. You can take the old ones out of the priority queue and put the old, new ones back in. And so then you can do this in n log n time, this step here for finding the closest step. So, so, so what you do is you take out, so for each of these clusters is associated with about n distances each, you take all of those distances out of the priority queue, each of them in log n time, and then you merge them together to a new cluster, you calculate those n new distances, and you put all those back in in log n time each. And the, that takes n log n, and it takes log n to get the, the, the smallest distance out of here. So it doesn't matter which of the distances you're using, as long as you can calculate it, um, the, the distance in constant time, then this becomes n times n log n, and this goes to n squared times log n. So you can improve this a little bit um, if you're using a priority key. It's still kind of slow. This log n, I mean this n squared is, is usually going to be too slow. And, and also something like the, 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 the minimum distance between two clusters is not necessarily easy to find either. Right? This is not just a constant time. Just computing this distance may take time proportional to the this, the product of the size of the two clusters, if you don't do it um, more carefully. So, so this distance can make this calculation even, even larger, this runtime, if you're calculating the, the minimum length and you're not doing it wisely. Um, there are other versions where you can shortcut, and instead of only merging the closest two clusters, you say, you know, I don't care exactly about this hierarchy. I'm going to start by finding all pairs of points which are within a certain distance. So I go and look at all the n squared distances, find all the ones within a threshold, and I add all those in at once. And then I increase the threshold a little bit and repeat this until I stop at some point. And this will be a bit more efficient, but you're going to lose some of this hierarchical structure. Um, you can maybe go back and, and uh, try and add this in, but you're, you've kind of um, you've changed the order in, in, in which you've done this. Um, so there are some ways to speed this up, but they lose some of the structure you get out of it. And, and that's a trade-off, the, the speed versus the structure. Um, one final point, um, um, I want to make is these items are generally not very stable. Um, so if a lot of times with distances, especially distances that look like this when your data points are, you know, if you think of the, the distance between um, these documents, it was a very discrete distance, and you'll have lots of ties. So this notion of closest is maybe not as easy to define as, as we thought it was. You could have ties here, and so you need to break the tie somehow. Maybe you can try and add both, or you can say, you're going to pick one of them and add that one. Um, but that choice can end up having a pretty large effect on the, hier on the, on the, the, the hierarchy of the cluster. Um, choosing to move, merge, say, five with six and seven may make this look fairly different. Or maybe if I had chosen three, if I had done five with six as the first step, maybe that was a little bit closer, then this may have changed the, the structure of the clustering uh, um, a lot. Right? And, and so if their if they're ties or the distances are not completely accurate, um, you can have a big difference in the cluster. Um, well, so again, though this is true, but it's also not true, right? If, if the data is very well clusterable, there are very obvious clusters, um, then 
it is probably going to be pretty stable. You are going to get about the same clusters no matter how you break ties. And just about any sort of distance, any of these choices you use to pick the distance, in most cases will give you about the same cluster. And a pretty similar hierarchy probably. Um, but if the data is kind of not very obvious clusters, all the points are evenly spread out, then most then it's going to be very unstable, and you're probably not going to get a very good clustering or anything very, very meaningful, um, very meaningful about the data. Um, so, um, so, 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 so all of this is interesting. You need to choose your distances wisely, but in a lot of cases, it's not going to matter. It's going to matter in weird cases like this if you use single link. You're going to be able to find something that looks like cluster, weird cluster that's like this, where you you aren't if you use, say, the, the, the maximum distance. And you need to decide if you want to find clusters like this. And only in these kind of weird boundary cases is it really going to matter so much which which of the distances um, you end up using, and which you know, and which threshold you end up using. If you if you choose if you choose k in some way that's stupid. You could do badly, but if you use something like this bubble technique, most of the distances will find about the same elbow. You'll have the same kind of breakdown around the same point. Um, it doesn't won't matter so much if you use density or if or if you use the size of the cluster so much. Um, that's they'll probably work about the same. Okay. Um, so th this is all I'm going to say about hierarchical clusters. So does anyone have any, any general questions about this before I, before I move on? Um, we've got another 15 minutes, so I'm going to actually do a completely different clustering algorithm called the case set, doing the, 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 um, um, the case center cluster. So with the hierarchical clustering, um, I was defining the, the cost and the, the distance between clusterings and how well the, the clustering worked kind of as part of, as part of the algorithm. Um, with, with assignment based clustering, um, we're going to first define what we want in the clustering and then we'll come up with algorithms of trying to solve. We're not going to kind of mix together the, the cost function we want and the algorithm to find it. And generally when analyzing algorithms, it's good to have kind of, if you want to do a good analysis of them, you need to kind of predefine your cost function and not kind of mix it being the cost functions defined as part of the algorithm. So in some, so a lot of kind of uh, the people working in, in, the, in the field of the algorithms like the, the assignment based clustering better because it's a very it's a well defined problem, right? So, so what we're going to have is we're going to specify again some some value k and maybe we can try different k's and, and do this this elbow technique to, to find the best one. But find k clusters and actually we're going to find um, k um, centers. Um, C one. And so, and we'll call this set C, um, we'll call it something else, we'll call it R. And then for a point X, um, we're going to find, and uh, let's see, we're going to find a function phi of R of X, which is it's going to be the, the um, the R min of C and in R of the distance between X and C. Right? So this R min, this for a point X, this is going to return me the closest of the centers. So you have these centers and this V of R is going to return the closest one. Okay? And now a a um, a cluster CI is defined as the set X in, in X um, such that um, 
of r x is equal to small c of r. <coughs> so this is the big c of the cluster, and this is the set. So it's all points which are assigned to this cluster star. So, so then once I define, given a distance, and once I define my cluster centers, then the clusters are defined um, um, are defined in a way that's implicit. I don't need to actually write down the clusters themselves. I can just worry about the cluster centers, and then I can use this function phi to find the, the, the assignment <coughs> of the, the, the closest points. Okay. So this is like the, the need for assignment-based clustering, and there are kind of three main variations of this. Um, there's the k-center um, problem, which is um, the goal is to find the set um, R, which um, minimizes the, um, the max x and x of, um, of d of x, d of r x. Right, so this is given given the set of centers and the set x, I want to minimize the largest distance from any point um, onto the center. So the, the worst case assignment, so this is like this minimum closing ball version we saw before. You have a set of, of, of points. And let's say I've got three centers here. C1, C2, and C3. And then this K center cost is going to be this farthest distance. So everything is mapped, all of these points are mapped by phi onto C3. The assignment is implicit here. Right? These are the closest point. And the maximum distance is what I want to minimize. Okay, so then, th then, the, then the version of this that um, um, that most of you have heard of is the k-means clustering, and that's the r um, which minimizes the sum over x and x of the distance from x to phi of r of x. And this is the sum of these squared distances. So that's the k-means clustering. And then there's also the k um, the k-median clustering which is R, which minimizes the sum of x and x of So k-means clustering is a formulation, is not an algorithm. On Wednesday, we'll talk about Lloyd's algorithm, which is the algorithm you probably use to try and solve k-means clustering. Talk about that. That's called Lloyd's algorithm. The key means of the formulation, and it's actually a little bit of a strange formulation. You're minimizing the sum of the squared distances, whereas the median just minimizes the sum of the distances. This, if you write it this way, the k-median clustering seems to make a lot more sense. Um, why would you want to square the distances? Well, it's because of basically it's, it's, it's because of Lloyd's algorithm. Lloyd's algorithm works really well, and we'll discuss this properties on Wednesday, um, and some other things that work maybe even better than Lloyd's algorithm. But, um, but so, so these are the other two formulations. And this k-center one is um, is the least stable, stable among these. It's, instead of the sum, we're looking at the maximum value here. So a single point very far away will control the cost of this cluster. And sometimes it makes you do weird things, right? If this point was a little bit further away, um, it is going to be out here, and you only have three clusters, then probably what you're going to do is you're going to waste C3 down here, and then all these points, based on their assignment, are going to get mapped up to C2. You're going to get this cluster all the way down here. And so maybe this is what you want. Maybe you want to make sure you capture all of the points. 
Um, so, but and but the thing is, the k means clustering will sometimes do this too. Uh, at this point, it may be worth it because of the square distances that you want to spend a cluster, a center cluster, a center all the way out here. Um, sometimes that will minimize the cost. Um, and k median is much less likely to do that. The, because you're looking at the square distances, this one being far away from something really, really means something. Um, so, um, okay. So we'll, um, so it's it's good to mind what you're interested in um, in, in finding. Out. Okay. So in the last five minutes, and I'll probably try and repeat this on, on, on Wednesday quickly. But there's a very simple algorithm for the k-center problem. Well, first I'll mention. This is NP hard to solve exactly. To find the, the centers which minimize this, which actually actually minimize this. Um, to find the optimal solution. So we're not going to find the optimal solution. In fact, it's it's NP hard to do a two minus epsilon approximation, where you, you get smaller than a factor two from the optimal solution. That's also NP hard. So even getting close to the right answer. In all cases, is hard to do. But this is; these are from really weird examples that don't, you know, um, that are that don't occur in practice very much. And in fact, there's a very simple algorithm which is guaranteed to give you a two approximation within a two within a factor two of the optimal um, of of the optimal sum, and it's called the uh, Gonzalez algorithm. Um, I think this was from like 1985 or so. Maybe this was known at some point earlier, but it's a, it's a really really simple um, algorithm here. Um, so you um, so what it's going to do is it's going to choose. Um, it's going to we're going to use a definition where um, where R i is going to be the center of C1 up to C i. So this is a subset, and we're going to choose. So, so the first step is going to be to choose C1 um, um, arbitrarily. 